Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to the New Books Network. I am Dr. Melik Fratalti, a musician and a neuroscientist. My research focuses on deciphering the pathomechanisms of neurodegenerative and neurodevelopmental disorders. Today I will be your host and we will be talking to Anne Mendelssohn about her new book, Spoiled, The Myth of Milk as Superfood. Mendelssohn's book is a history of the food she describes as drinking milk, referring to dairy animals' milk that is consumed in fluid form rather than as some kind of fermented sour milk or cheese. Contrary to popular belief, it never figured prominently in human diets until very recently. Mendelssohn argues that milk's rise to the status of nutritional mainstay, the first scientifically anointed superfood of the modern industrialized world, was one of the great flukes of food history. The purpose of this book is not to portray drinking milk from dairy animals as a dangerous poison, but to explain how milk is produced and to debunk the idea that milk in unfermented fluid form is a food of unique virtues whose use goes back to remote prehistory. Along the way, she provides an interesting look at the history of the raw versus pasteurized milk debate and how it has developed into not only a public health debate, but also a personal choice question adopted by those on opposite sides of the political spectrum. Ellen, thank you very much for joining us today and welcome to the show. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I am slightly ill as you might uh, have noticed already. But other than that, everything's great. So um, let's start with you first. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your training? Well, I started out as a medievalist, uh, studying the poetry of Geoffrey Chaucer. Um, And a lot of people who write about food have similar stories of having begun in a completely different career and kind of accidentally wandered into food food writing. Um, Well, uh, long story short, um, I married a freelance photographer and um, switched careers to revealing. And a close friend of my husband was the New York editor of Bon Appetit magazine, And she asked me to start reviewing cookbooks for the magazine. And one thing kind of led to another. Um, And I I found that I absolutely loved writing about food um, and the history of food. And how did you get interested in milk? How did you come to write Spoiled? And why now? Well, um, this this may sound... Um, irrelevant or off the point, but I grew up in a part of the United States, uh, a part of Pennsylvania, uh, where there were lots and lots and lots of little farms where the people had, they grew a bit of everything and they contributed um, to local markets in a small way that would have some apple trees. Uh, there might be a pig or two, and there were always a few cows. Um, you would see the milk cans sitting out, uh, waiting to be picked up by a local dairy company at the um, oh, in the morning, possibly the afternoon, um, and that whole way of life is something that I miss to this day. Just seeing a landscape with different kinds of small farming going on and a few cows who are just behaving like normal cows sitting in the pasture, uh, coming into the barn to be milked in the morning and the evening. And this is all gone. And It may not seem relevant to this book, but it is. I always wish I could recreate that world. Sounds very relevant indeed, actually. And um, I see a lot of, I live in Switzerland and I I can tell you, I see a lot of cows every day. (laughs) uh... (laughs) So in Spoiled, 
um, you talk a lot about the biology and chemistry of milk, which I found really interesting because one would assume we already know about milk, the contents and the nutritional value of milk. Um, but you really get into uh, detail on, on, on these uh, topics. Could you maybe expand on that a little bit? Well, uh, milk starts out as the first food, the only food for all newborn mammals. It replaces the blood supply that was delivered to the fetus uh, through the placenta during pregnancy. So lactation begins just as pregnancy ends, and it continues until the infant human or infant calf or giraffe or, or whatever um, is weaned. At that point, the mother's memory system shuts down milk production, and at some point between weaning and puberty, uh, the offspring's digestive system um, undergoes a crucial change. Now, um, well, everything about milk is complicated, so uh, let me introduce a little bit of chemistry. Um, chemically speaking, any animal's milk is an incredibly complex substance, and uh, just to barely scratch the surface, it's technically a suspension with very intricate molecules uh, containing casein floating around, floating around and suspended in it. It's also an emulsion with globules of milk fat um, emulsified in it. And on top of all that, it's also a solution with an incredible number of water-soluble substances dissolved in it. And one of these substances is a kind of sugar called lactose. Uh, lactose is important because it supplies a great deal of energy, um, caloric energy, uh, to the newborn who needs calories. So as long as the baby is nursing, its digestive system secretes an enzyme called lactase that breaks down lactose into two simpler sugars, glucose and galactose. Sooner or later after weaning, the secretion of the enzyme shuts down. As a result, um, the little giraffe or human or calf or whatever uh, loses the ability to digest lactose. And by the time uh, the infant reaches adulthood, it would experience a lot of um, digestive distress, um, diarrhea, maybe nausea and vomiting, painful cramps, um, by trying to drink fresh milk. So um, humans are, are the only mammals that consume other mammals' milk. And what originally enabled them to do that, um, to, well, I mean, this is very remarkable when you think of it, uh, one species consuming another species' milk would enable them to do um, to do this. Probably on um, the trait surface, probably the history came into um, focus between about 10,000 and 8,000 BC in prehistoric um, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, and neighboring regions. Uh, where people discovered that the milk of herbivores like sheep, goats, cows, um, went sour when exposed to the ambient air. Because these are regions with very warm temperatures, hot temperatures in summer, uh, which is when the milking season was. And the um, you might be high daytime temperatures of 40 or 45 degrees um, Celsius. And this was the perfect condition for attracting swarms of bacteria, particular bacteria, lactic acid bacteria, that were drawn by the presence of all of that lactose in the milk. Um, so two important things happened here. First of all, uh, when you draw 
a bowl or a pail of milk from any animal into um, the outside world. Um, let's say this morning you have just milked the goat. There's the milk sitting in a bowl. Well, by noon, by lunchtime, you have something like yogurt. Um, you have a kind of sour milk that is delicious um, in its own right. Um, and it is digestible to people who can't digest lactose. Um, and because of the greater acidity, the reduced pH, it inhibits a lot of kinds of pathogens from invading it. So on the whole, soured milk in prehistoric times, in fact, um, until well, relatively recent times, was a lot safer to consume. Uh, than fresh milk. Fascinating indeed. And um, so you mentioned that um, the, the, the story of dairy farming started um, almost 10,000 years ago. So how did this yes. process evolve over centuries um, and also the practices of dairy farming? Well, maybe I, maybe I should jump ahead a bit and introduce another little wrinkle. Um, and Researchers are not exactly sure when this happened. Maybe between about 5,000 BC and 2,000 BC. Um, but for some reason, somewhere in prehistoric Europe, uh, a genetic mutation appeared in a group or groups of people that knocked out that genetic command um, to stop secreting lactase. Um, and uh, people who inherited this new um, genetic condition were able to go on producing lactase and uh, therefore digesting fresh, unsoured milk throughout their lives. Uh, I guess we can come back to that uh, later. Um, but meanwhile, uh, going back to how dairy farming originated, uh, First of all, people started domesticating some of the large grass-eating animals uh, for meat, uh, sheep, goats, cattle. And these were regions, these um, parts of Iran, Iraq, Turkey, etc., regions with tremendous grasslands where the animals would uh, range um, dozens or hundreds of miles, eating their way from one part to the other of the range. Um, and people learned to sort of track their movements, uh, figure out you know, when you could ambush um, a herd of goats or whatever. And as they became more accustomed to using the meat of the animals, uh, they also um, developed a curiosity about the milk. Um, nobody has documented just when people officially learned to milk, learn the particular way that you have to apply pressure to the, the tea, mimicking the action of a little kid's or lambs or calves mouth um, but once they had learned um, and once they saw that the milk went sour right away and was delicious to them um, they began trying to um, persuade the animals to live sedentary lives along with them this is not easy because these are just natural wanderers. Um, left to their own devices, they would just go on eating their way um, across the, you know, the great steppe of Eurasia or uh, whatever realm of uh, grasslands. Um, so some people, some societies, uh, devoted themselves uh, to trying to keep animals penned up and breeding in captivity, which is sort of the definition of domestication, um, while others learned to follow them on their migrations. Uh, they learned, once they had domesticated horses, 
which happened probably three or four thousand years after the other animals, uh, horses were the ideal instrument for letting people keep up with the migrations of naturally migratory milk animals. And this, um, well, the whole way of life of pastoral nomadism, it was going strong even 150 years ago. Um, it keeps being wiped out more and more um, everywhere um, in those original lands of pastoralism. But um, the, the, uh, one of the most interesting things about these pastoralists, these nomads, is that they are some of the most heavily milk-dependent societies anywhere in the world. Um, the milk is always fermented, and it is usually the milk of horses, uh, mares, which is uh, so... Kind of that be the kumis? The kumis? Yes. Uh, kumis is made from mare's milk. I mean, real kumis, true kumis. So mare's milk, um, it has much more lactose. It has a tremendous amount of lactose uh, compared with cows or um, goats or the others. Um, and it has very little fat um, and very little protein. You could never make cheese from mare's milk. Uh, but it has so much lactose uh, that under the right conditions, uh, hot summer days, it ferments to release both carbon dioxide and alcohol. So it's effervescent and it's uh, somewhat boozy. And in the middle of the 19th century, European scientists began to discover, aha, this is a perfect cure for tuberculosis. Um, I mean, preventative for tuberculosis. It's a cure for anything. Um, it is the elixir of life. Um, it tasted a little peculiar, and it was impossible to make because the mares refused to give it any place except their own homeland. Uh, when it was taken to, um, like, St. Petersburg or Moscow, uh, the mares just said, oh, no. Um, and entrepreneurs who wanted to market the stuff, they... Um, developed this technique of taking cow's milk, modifying it by skimming it and um, diluting it somewhat to um, so it was less protein and adding a lot of sugar. And this was so its coolness in oh, Poland, France, most of Europe, and the United States. And it arrived in the United States this was one of the really fascinating historical footnotes I came across. It got there just in time to be administered to the United States President, uh, James A. Garfield, who was assassinated in 1881 um, by an assassin with a pistol. Um, so the bullet remained lodged in the poor man for a couple of months. Um, the doctors completely flubbed the business of um, getting it out and treating him. Uh, but at some point, they started administering this fake um, cow's milk-based kumis. And the newspapers got hold of President Garfield treating with kumis. And, of course, um, it instantly sparked a great market for kumis. Um, even people like Mark Twain were getting in on the act. Um, and for a few years, there was a great coolness vogue in the U.S. It sort of died down after a while. And what about the yogurt? Well, the yogurt um, came on the scene uh, pretty soon after people were losing interest in coolness. Um, first of all, there were a lot of, well, a lot of, um, an appreciable number of um, immigrants from the Ottoman Empire, uh, many of them Armenians. And Armenians in 
the U.S. Um, started were isolating cultures uh, to reproduce, uh, to keep the culture. They were able to keep the culture going from batch to batch um, efficiently enough to start selling it commercially. And uh, they advertised it with slogans like the elixir of life um, and far more palatable than coolness. So shortly after that, uh, a woman comes, Elia Mitchnikov, in France. He was um, originally from uh, Belarus, um, but he settled in France at the Pasteur Institute and became interested in digestive theories about how to prolong life um, by kind of policing what was going on in the colon by this time. People knew enough about bacteriology to recognize that there were actual organisms in the human digestive system. So a theory was going around um, that food putrefies in the colon and that it's a terrible evolutionary mistake, and we would all be better without it. Uh, and Mitchnikov was you know, highly interested in uh, this thinking. Um, and he decided, um, after he got hold of some yogurt um, produced by a Bulgarian colleague, um, that one of the particular organisms that had been isolated from yogurt was the key. They now call it Lactobacillus bulgaricus. And when it ferments milk by itself, it produces terribly, terribly sour, uh, almost inedibly sour yogurt. Um, but Mechnikov thought this acidity was perfect for knocking out all the enemy bacteria in the colon. And he um, allowed a French company to uh, start producing uh, what they called uh, Y-A-H-O-U-R-T-E-T-H-E -E, um, in commercial quantities. Um, that spelling, that is the phonetic spelling of the Turkish word as pronounced in Turkish. Um, there is no yogurt with a, high, a hard G in Turkish. So yogurt took off in a big, big way um, in England and in, in the United States. Um, it took off not because people liked it, but because they thought it might add 50 years to their lifespan. And people were quoted in newspaper squibs of saying, gee, maybe I'd rather be dead. However, uh, it hung on for a few decades until somebody came along with a replacement. By then, it had been discovered that the, the magical um, bacillus did not reach the colon. When you ate yogurt, it was knocked out of action by the acidity in the stomach. And so yogurt was never going to reform uh, the malefactors in your colon. However, um, an American scientist um, discovered a replacement uh, called Lactobacillus acidophilus, uh, which also is murderously sour. Uh, so acid that you don't know why anybody would really want to eat it, um, except that it's supposedly preventive. And yogurt fell into obscurity for some decades. Um, acidophilus yogurt has kind of had its own niche for quite a while. Uh, but yogurt had come back um, during the 1960s when a lot of hippies on communes uh, began raising their own cows or goats um, and finding that they didn't exactly know what to do with the milk, uh, but realizing that 
if they got hold of some uh, commercial cultures of yogurt from an outfit like Danon, and the commercial cultures have more than one organism. They have several acting at once in a kind of feedback with each other, uh, which mellows the acidity, which um, is much closer to what the yogurt would have been like um, before Metchnikov got hold of it. Um, so yogurt again surfaced and acquired um, a reputation both as a, a health food for hippies and eventually a sort of a snack for everybody as the yogurt companies learned to add more and more sugar to it. And today, uh, yogurt is, well, it's a strange spectacle. Um, I don't know about Switzerland, but in the United States, you go to the dairy aisle in the supermarket, and uh, there is, I don't know, uh, there's maple cream yogurt, uh, there's chocolate yogurt, um, there is raspberry fluff yogurt. There, I mean, if you look hard, you can find plain yogurt, uh, but even the plain yogurt comes in whole milk or reduced fat and no fat. Well, no fat yogurt, low fat yogurt is simply not worth I know what you mean. Um, there is also a huge variety of yogurt products um, in Switzerland as well. So how did the idea of drinking milk become popular? Because it's very difficult, actually, to keep milk fresh. Well, I think then maybe the question should be not how, um, but where and when. It had to be in a country where everybody, or almost, almost everybody, uh, possessed that mutation I mentioned earlier. The one that enabled people to digest lactose, popular, excuse me, or to digest lactose as adults, instead of ceasing to secrete lactase, or that all important enzyme, after weaning, like all other mammals, and like the majority of humans, or um, even today, um, so-called lactose tolerance is prevalent in maybe 30%, 35% of the human race, and the rest is lactose intolerant. Um, anyhow, the when is crucial. Um, the where, it had to be people with uh, the right uh, mutation. The when, it had to be after about the 17th century in the places where the mutation was prevalent, uh, because these places were home to the developing disciplines of science, including medical science, and they were home to the great colonial powers who kind of got to set an agenda for the rest of the world uh, to tell other people what was good for everybody. Well. England was a mighty power to be reckoned with in the 17th world, uh, 17th and 18th centuries, and even more uh, later. There's plenty of evidence that milk drinking had become popular and even fashionable in London when Samuel Pepys was compiling his celebrated diaries in, uh, in the 1660s. And a few generations later, uh, maybe around 1710, a celebrity doctor named George Cheney, C-H-E-Y-N-E, -E, got, to, got to work inventing a celebrity diet, a wonder diet um, that was centered on large amounts of fresh milk as a remedy for disordered nerves. Disordered nerves were a very fashionable ailment among the upper classes at that point. So, um, a few decades later, uh, Cheney's theories were picked up by specialists in treating young children. By about the year 1800, it was accepted wisdom 
that uh, all children should drink cow's milk fresh, and uh, by the pint or quart, as absolutely the most important food that can be poured into a tender young system. And we're talking about fresh, unsoured cow's milk, because another tenet of this new belief was that sour milk was spoiled milk, and you had to uh, you had to avoid it at all costs unless you wanted to kill innocent children. So, in reality, uh, putting this kind of emphasis on unsoured milk put children's lives at risk. The problem was, uh, the problem, the apostles of fresh milk for kids, what they ended up doing was creating a steeply increased demand long before there was any way to monitor the quality of the supply. The idea that fresh milk was an absolute necessity for all children or trickled down from the upper classes to lower classes uh, in urban neighborhoods, poor urban neighborhoods, not only in England but in North America. Well, this this increased market for fresh, unsoured cow's milk was an absolute bonanza for shady operators who were rushed to set up dairy barns, uh, barns uh, by courtesies and with filthy, filthy sheds, uh, next to city distilleries or breweries, and they bought up the waste sheep uh, to feed to the luckless cows that uh, were unfortunate enough to be stabled in the premises. So all too predictably, in the 19th century, milk became a vector for food-borne pathogens in big cities. Um, this was before anybody knew that such a thing as pathogens existed. <laughs> so, um, it soon became obvious that, it, that people better find some way to make fresh milk safer. And about 1880, researchers began, began talking about the kind of heat treatments that Louis Pasteur had already applied to the yeast for wine and beer. The language was a bit muddled at first. Uh, people didn't know whether to say sterilization or purification. And finally, they decided on pasteurization. Uh, but the idea was to heat the milk to a certain temperature under the boiling point that would knock out particular pathogens uh, before chilling and bottling it under strict sanitary precautions. I mean, this was what enabled such a thing as a milk industry, a true milk industry, to take shape. And so how did the dairy industry and technologies respond to, to this uh, demand for drinking milk? Well, uh, by getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Because between about uh, 1910, 1915, there was an absolute cascade of discoveries by nutritionists about the wonderful nutrients uh, that were contained in milk. Um, calcium, just more calcium than, in, than any other common food. Lots and lots of protein, mostly in the form of casein. Um, vitamins, vitamin A, some of the B vitamins. And as a result, public health authorities started talking as if it was the absolute duty of every parent to pour target amounts of milk into every child um, because otherwise the, the child was in danger of being uh, insufficiently nourished with vitamin A or not enough protein, not enough calcium, kid would get rickets. And the propaganda was so successful um, that generations of parents from then until now, or over the last, the last 
hundred years at least, have thought that their child is going to be in terrible danger if a pint or a quart, preferably a quart, of fresh milk is poured into it every day. And this reputation of fresh milk, as opposed to, um, to sound milk or cheese, this reputation has never been damaged somehow. Milk has retained the reputation of a superfood, as mentioned in the subtitle of my book, uh, and there is no other form of dairy product that is as culturally central uh, to the United States, certainly, uh, and to a lesser extent, other Western European nations, uh, that is as culturally central and normative um, as drinking milk. Its position is, to say the least, exalted. So in Spoiled, you also talk about the, the formation of mega dairy farms and um, the, the um, selection for high-performing cows. Could you expand on that as well? Uh, yeah. Uh, there was this just this push to expand, 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 more and more and more. And there could be no such thing as too much milk. The big danger was not enough milk. Well, it looked like a bonanza for dairy farmers at first. This was a surefire, get-rich-quick product. Except there are things about milk that make it very difficult to make a reliable living from it. That is fresh, unsoured milk. It's always going to be a buyer's market. It's never going to be a seller's market. Um, because the product is so perishable, it is so bulky, it is so hard to handle, uh, so subject to bacterial invasion and uh, other dangers, that you have to spend an awful lot of money uh, to produce it safely. The farmers kept being told, well, um, just expand your herd. You have a larger herd, you'll have a larger income. You'll be able to invest in things like a milking machine, which is more sanitary than hand milking. Uh, you'll be able to invest in a tank for learn, chilling the milk, refrigerating it until the dairy company comes and picks it up. Every time the farmers decided to take the expert's advice and expand production, they found that they were they were not keeping up with production costs. It was sort of a, a race or a game in which they were almost bound to be defeated. So the economies of scale that kept being urged on the dairy farmers ended up by almost transforming cows out of anything you would recognizes a cow, or the sole purpose of a cow was to give as much milk as you could possibly squeeze out of her. Um, and the amounts that you can get out of the cow kept growing and growing and growing by new technologies. Um, feed the cow, not grass, not hay, uh, but rations with a lot of soybeans or corn, more high energy, high calorie feed. Uh, that sure does increase production, but it also, it, it's very difficult for an animal with a ruminant stomach, like a cow, uh, to digest this kind of feed. And it's a stress over a certain point. It's a stress on the cow's body. Um, farmers learn to do balancing acts to keep cows just on the threshold of maybe ruminal acidosis um, because the new feeds were 
with new feeds and encouraged different bacteria uh, to propagate in the rumen. And these bacteria produced more acidity, lowered the pH uh, to the point uh, where the regular bacteria couldn't compete. Um, the cows who were the new improved cows and cows kept getting newer and more improved. They were less likely to live past their fifth birthday. A healthy cow, well treated, and couldn't live to 20. Uh, the new improved cows often had difficulty calving. Uh, they were subject to mastitis, um, inflammation of the udder. Um, when a cow has mastitis, you have to separate the milk from the rest of the herd's milk and dump it um, until uh, you have treated the mastitis with antibiotics and all the antibiotics are out of the system. And then you can go back to feeding the cow the way you were feeding her and uh, having the same problem uh, two months later. And this became very, very wearisome to dairy farmers. They have dropped out by the hundreds in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, by the thousands after the 1950s. Or there are, there's only a comparative handful of real dairy farmers left in the country. And those that survive are mega dairies, which have economies of scale so weird, so crazy, uh, that it, it boggles the mind. Uh, a 5,000 cow farm is not a tremendously big farm nowadays. Uh, there are many 10,000 cow farms of the animals, of course, um, hardly ever see such a thing as a blade of grass. Um, they live, <laughs> they live in confined operations. Uh, Ten thousand, fifteen thousand, uh, and twenty-five thousand. Uh, the sky's the limit. Uh, the industry keeps talking about even larger and larger mega dairies. The result for if you happen to be a neighbor of the mega dairy, if you happen to live in a nearby town, uh, you are seeing local water polluted, you're seeing uh, local aquifers just depleted to just run dry. Uh, you are seeing uh, methane pollution of the air to where you hardly want to let your children out of the house. There's just innumerable environmental consequences that go with these mega dairying operations. Indeed, it's um, the, the, the mega dairy farms and uh, the consequences indeed and their environmental impact. Um, it, it, it is a very important uh, topic. In Spoiled, you also discussed the idea of raw milk. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about this and um, its pros and cons? Um, well, raw milk, just means milk that has not been pasteurized. It hasn't been um, subjected to heat treatment to eliminate pathogens. And the most common methods used today, um, they also eliminate a lot of other bacteria. The milk isn't technically sterilized. Sterilized meaning removed of all bacteria unless it's heated to a much, much higher temperature, well above the boiling point of water. So the big pet push for pasteurization um, took shape when people were getting very worried about the consequences of these horrible dairies uh, that, were, that had cows stabled in horrible premises next to distilleries or the breweries, the cows being fed on the waste became sick. Uh, children being fed on the milk became sick. And how to make the milk safe was a great priority. 
uh, along came the idea of pasteurization after the 1880s, and by the 1918, by the 1890s, there were debates going on about whether it was a better idea to pasteurize milk to get rid of the pathogens, or whether it was a better idea to produce raw milk under very strict sanitary precautions um, so that the pathogens never had a chance to get in in the first place. And people who um, espoused this second idea worked out a method of certifying uh, milk, uh, keeping track of everything that the farmer did. Um, and the farmer uh, was con contractually obligated to abide by every precaution that was mentioned in the contract. And uh, the milk was going to be clean and safe for infants or children or grown-ups. The only hitch was that incorporating all these precautions and protocols into the milking process was expensive. It was so expensive uh, that by about 1910, 1915, everybody could see that certified raw milk was being priced out of the market. The certified proponents kept arguing, our milk is really clean, pasteurization causes chemical changes in the milk. Uh, pasteurization is just an excuse for covering up sloppy milk because uh, everything comes out in the wash. Um, the certified proponents really retreated into obscurity for decades. But after about the 1980s, 90s, the raw milk movement came back to life. It came roaring back to life or with a vengeance. And the argument that pasteurized milk is somehow interfered with, it's lost its purity. It, it is pseudo-milk, as a lot of people call it, dead milk. This argument is not, as far as I'm concerned, I would not say it has a great deal of scientific validity, but it has a lot of emotional Heal. And it was attractive to people who had inherited a distrust of authority from the hippie and countercultural movements of the 1960s and 70s. Sort of automatic distrust of authority, institutions, which is a trend that has gone on and on and on and keeps being magnified in the U.S., and raw milk is a good example. Um, the, one of the really attractive arguments um, about raw milk is that Americans are really devoted to the idea of individual rights. Nobody gets to push me around. Nobody gets to tell me what I can put in my mouth and I have a right to do my own medical research and act on my own conclusions. That argument is being made in dozens of state legislatures around the country, and it's being heard in Congress. Uh, and I believe it's a stupid and dangerous attitude, um, but the response of the public health authorities has to be almost equally uh, stupid and harmful. It's uh, shut up and let us tell you what to do. All right. The, the result is criminalizing the production of raw milk um, and the, the distribution. And I accept the argument that pasteurization makes milk safer. But I also see that there's a fine argument for milk being produced, raw milk being produced, 
enforce very stringent precautions and government inspection, a stringent, constant inspection and supervision. And this could reduce the danger um, of raw milk to almost nothing. But almost nothing is not enough for the authorities. Um, they want 100% guarantees that there will be no pathogens at all in the raw milk, um, sort of ignoring the fact that there have been some embarrassing um, epidemics of pasteurized milk spreading disease uh, because there was some hitch in the pasteurization or the post-pasteurization handling. Um, just because milk is pasteurized, you, you can have a fair amount of trust in it, in its safety, um, but not necessarily 100%. And I must say that unhomogenized milk, unpasteurized milk, tastes more like milk. The way milk is produced, commercially produced, is the way it appears in supermarkets. It has been manhandled um, so much that it's lost a great deal of the, the appeal of, of milk. Uh, the raw milk guys also, they are among the few voices uh, speaking up about the treatment of dairy animals and uh, the environmental pollution, uh, environmental degradation caused by the mainstream industry. Uh, so I think they have a certain amount to be said on their side. And I wish instead of yelling at each other in uh, unproductive harangues, uh, the proponents and opponents uh, could have rational conversations. I agree. And um, I think I don't remember the taste of unhomogenized and unpasteurized milk. <laughs> it's it's quite interesting to us because oh, um, and, well, uh, milk is earlier. I was saying that milk, as we get it in the U.S. in supermarkets, um, it's been uh, chemically, uh, well, it's been industrially processed to an extent that it it doesn't really resemble the milk that comes out of a cow. Uh, and first of all. Uh, the milk truck comes to the farm and picks up the milk and takes it to the processing plant. Well, um, there, the first thing they do is to um, separate the cream from the skim milk through centrifuge. Then they recombine the cream and the milk in arbitrary percentages or by homogenization. That is, they force the milk um, and cream um, through tiny apertures under pressure um, that break down the large milk fat globules of the milk into many globules that are too small to be affected by gravity and float to the surface of the milk in a cream layer. So. Most people in this country have never seen milk with a cream layer. It's a, it would be a great surprise. Anyhow, the way milk comes out of a cow, and there are differences between breeds of cow, but still, um, no matter what, no matter what the breed is, there is going to be oh somewhere between maybe four um, to eight percent milk fat in the milk, and about nine percent what they call um, SNF solids, non-fat, meaning everything else besides the milk fat that isn't water, uh, all the soluble things and the proteins. Uh, so that can easily be nine percent in normal cow's milk. So think about that, 4 to 7 or 8% milk fat, or 9% solids, non-fat. Uh, what they call whole milk, what is officially allowed to be sold as whole milk in this country, has 
3.25% milk fat. It has 8.25% solids non-fat, SNF. Um, this is just amazing. This is not like, this stuff does not taste like milk. It doesn't look like milk because of the cream lamb. And it's a, it's a poor substitute for real whole milk. But um, because the milk is homogenized, you can't see any fresh usual cardboard cartons. Um, you can't see what's inside. Um, people have got used to just pouring some anonymous white substance out of the carton into a milk glass and drinking it and not wondering about what has been done to it in the meantime. It's really been a technologically manhandled. So where do you see, um, how do you see the, the, the future of dairy farming and milk consumption? Do you think that raw milk uh, could be accessible for many or would it be um, allowed? Uh, to be purchased. Um, what's your opinion? No, no, raw milk is always going to be a kind of a niche endeavor because it has to be done on a tiny, tiny scale. Or we're not going to have any 30,000 cow uh, raw milk dairies ever. No mega dairies. Um, in fact, um, that's one of the great things about the raw milk movement. Um, it has brought back all the contact between the producer and the consumer on, on small farms uh, where there may be only like 25 cows, 50 cows. That's a, a lot for um, a small family to cope with producing uh, 25 or 50 cows. That's a lot of work. Um, milking, even though the milking is done by machines, just uh, feeding and managing the animals. Non-stop work, if your heart is in it, it's worth it. I mean, so raw milk dairies cannot expand to a size where they can compete with commercial dairies, but they have inspired um, a lot of other people who are not necessarily up to the challenges of raw milk, um, but would like to produce better milk, pasteurized. Um, there's a lot of little um, independent dairies, that are uh, dairy farms, that have left the mainstream market and are just selling to interested consumers, uh, possibly distributing through uh, gourmet stores uh, or uh, selling at farmers markets, and uh, there's a very bright future, I should think, for them. But still, they're going to be small. They're not going to account for a large share of the whole market. Uh, they're just not going to be in the running. And as for the mainstream market, I'm I'm just not optimistic. Um, this is an enormous, gigantic industry that is, um, I think it would be kind to say it's approaching unsustainability. It might be more truthful to say that it's got there already in the, in the context of soil and air and water degradation and the logistics of getting every cow to produce still more milk even if it kills her. Um, to me, it seems as if the industry will have to downsize at some point in the future. But there's going to be a lot of collateral damage um, to farmers. Meanwhile, the American public is less and less interested in drinking milk. Uh, the peak of drinking milk consumption was in 1945. It's been going down hell ever since. Um, but what scares me most about the future, why I'm pessimistic, let's say, it's how eagerly the Western industrial model of milk production and distribution 
is being welcomed by other nations, uh, developing nations in the Far East, South Asia, Africa, South America. China, uh, China is already home to some of the world's biggest, most polluting mega farms. And the government has persuaded citizens that consuming a lot of drinking milk, whether they could digest it or not, um, is going to is going to contribute to Chinese national power um, in Eastern Africa. There are breeds of cattle that were developed by generations over the centuries um, of pastoral nomads, and that are adapted to the local climatic conditions. Um, and uh, there are ministries of agriculture who are eager to get Holstein cow genes going in support of industrialized dairying. So I'm afraid that even if America comes to its senses about the absurdities of the, of the modern drinking milk um, industry, the damage is going to continue elsewhere. It's going to continue in countries where people have no tradition uh, of full of producing and consuming milk, um, and often where they have uh, no genetic ability to digest lactose. I guess sooner or later we will have to deal with the question of um, how much we can keep on with the, the level of consumption that we uh, have at the moment and how that could be sustainable or not. Um, this has been a really fascinating discussion and Thank you so much. And I learned so much about milk and uh, dairy farming, thanks to your book. And uh, what are you currently working on? What's your next project? Well, this is completely different. Um, I'm, I'm trying to help a friend who was born in Georgia, that's uh, the Republic of Georgia, and lives in the United States. She's writing a cookbook about Georgian cuisine of four English-speaking audience in America, um, and this is a pretty um, a daunting project because of the amount of recipe testing, um, accommodating uh, terminology from the Georgian language um, into English, um, but it's fascinating. Um, I love Georgian food, and this is a kind of project that I haven't done for a while. Wow, looking forward to it as well. Thank you very much for joining me today. You're very welcome. Thank you.